Hello, Gomani Jirif. Good evening, everybody. Welcome to the Mythical Ireland Library. I'm Anthony Murphy, your host of this live stream. This is Book Talk, episode number 19. Tonight, we are going to be talking about Sir William Wilde's The Beauties of the Boyne and Blackwater, first published in 1849. I hope everybody is keeping safe and well and that we're all in good form. Uh, please do, as always, feel free to uh, announce your presence and we'll say hello uh, you're all very welcome along to this episode uh we are broadcasting sorry <laughs> I need to keep an eye and make sure that uh, we are actually live live on all the platforms that i'm about to announce um yeah uh we're live streaming on facebook on the mythical ireland facebook page on YouTube, on the Mythical Ireland YouTube channel, and that's easy to find, youtube.com forward slash Mythical Ireland, as is the Mythical Ireland page on Facebook, facebook.com forward slash Mythical Ireland, and also on the Mythical Ireland community on Facebook. And that's the one I'll keep an eye on here on the other screen, because I don't often see the... Uh, uh, I don't often see the comments, so I'm going to keep an eye on that there on the side screen. In the house tonight, I am delighted to welcome them. the first person to say hello is Charlie Grover. And uh, hello, Charlie. Hope you are keeping well and in good form, as they say, in fine fettle. Janet Moran is here, who say, says blessings, Anthony and Tribe from a warm, sunny Boston. Brilliant stuff. Glad to hear it's warm and sunny there. In fact, we are having something of an Indian summer here because uh, the recent uh, wet and dull weather has uh, give, suddenly given way in the past few days to nice uh, mild sunny warm weather brilliant stuff daisy peters is in the house it's a real pleasure to see our tour together yes indeed daisy and you of course are one of our fondest uh, members and uh, you're very welcome Stephen o'hara is in sunny kilkenny and uh, a, a fine part of the country indeed rose corain says Hi, tribes gathering. I thought I missed last night. Yeah, no, we had a, a family event yesterday, so I was unable to do the live stream due to other commitments. Uh, I did actually put a notice up on the various uh, channels to say that we'd have it on Tuesday instead of Monday. Hopefully that suits some people's agendas that uh, maybe don't get to watch us on Monday and maybe might get to join us this evening. Robert Friend is in the house. A lovely, friendly name. Robert Car Robeard Cara. Uh, you're very welcome, uh, Robert. Good to see you. And Scott Doherty is in the house. Hope it's been a great day for everyone. Not too bad uh, at all. And a lovely day here. Although I was working today, uh, I did get a chance to nip out into the sunshine for a little while at lunchtime. Michael Pike is in the house. Michael, you're very welcome along. Very good to see you. Uh, Diana is here from North Berwick in Maine, where it is hot and humid. Well, uh, it's uh, not so humid here, but it was mild and a really, really nice autumnal day. You can really see, can't you, how, you know, the summer is giving way to winter gradually, you know, and uh, it's getting dark quite a lot earlier than it was a couple of months ago when we had midsummer. And of course, we're sort of on the old sort of eight festival Celtic calendar, so to speak. We are roughly... Uh, no, we're not even halfway. We're uh, about two or so weeks after. The last festival of the calendar was Lunasa on the 7th of August. A lot of people celebrate Lunasa on the 1st of August. Uh, I celebrate it on the date uh, when the sun uh, is actually halfway between the uh, summer solstice and the autumn equinox. And of course, the next celebration is the autumn equinox in September. Don't forget that for reference to those dates, you may need to look at your Mythical Ireland 2021 calendar. And uh, the 2022 one is, uh, there's a draft design done, as you probably saw recently, and uh, hopefully we'll get that uh, published, printed in October. Mandy McCurl says, hello, everyone from a sun-kissed Isle of Mull. Lovely stuff, and I hope the sun kisses Mull very gently. Nick Eska Casterton is in the house. Hello, Nick. Good evening, Anthony, and the wonderful two. I had a lovely sunny day today. Fingers crossed for the rest of the week. Yeah, exactly. Let's hope it lasts for a few days at least. We had a ferocious thunderstorm on Saturday, I think it was. 
and uh, we had some very close strikes uh, probably the most ferocious thunderstorm we've had in a long time uh, all of it very very close by not much time between the lightning and the thunder of course three seconds represents one kilometer because sound travels at about 300 is it 334 meters per second something like that so if you count three seconds between the flash and the rumble that means the lightning was a kilometer away we had one flash uh, where the thunder happened instantaneously we actually thought the house had been struck that's how close it was anyway hope everybody survived that if you were in the area john swift is in glasgow and says hello hello john very uh, good evening to all our friends in scotland just over the water here from the Boyne Valley. Adina Sparks says, Afternoon, Anthony and the Tua. Yes, indeed, Adina. Very good afternoon to you and welcome. Jay Shaw is in British Columbia in Canada. Hello, Jay. A very good afternoon to you. Uh, always delighted to see our uh, Canadian friends on the live streams. It's soaking wet in the Hudson Valley, according to Snapper Earl. Well, that's just too bad because, I mean, the theme did look a little bit for a while there like warm and sunny everywhere but not quite everywhere but anyway somewhere has to be wet when everyone else is enjoying the sunshine mariana dunn is in sunny virginia yes indeed you see there you go there's a uh, snapper earl is probably feeling a little bit left out now uh, robin rickman is in a warm and sunny western pennsylvania lovely stuff uh, robin you're very welcome along marie landon is in the house hello anthony and Tua. it's good to see you all this eve as it is to see you marie you're very welcome to uh book talk i was just about to say live irish myths it's been a while since we had one of those paula snow queen says hello with lots of o's well hello indeed paula you're very welcome along to live uh i, I nearly did it again uh to book talk uh this evening Anne mccallum is uh, saying the weather here is much too hot to consider giving it the privilege of numerical significance uh, yes um use the kelvin scale and tell us what uh, yeah how many degrees kelvin is it adele perth who is in australia is now in wednesday when the rest of us are still in tuesday good morning to you adele or should i say good day i hope that you are safe and well and that all is good with you kathleen is in the san francisco bay area brilliant stuff kathleen lovely to have you along i've never been to california maybe i'll get the uh, privilege or the opportunity someday uh, but hello to all our friends on the west coast of the states barbara barney is in the house is saying hello to everyone jay barney welcome along uh, barbara even melanie is in georgia in the usa hello melanie you are uh, very welcome to our live stream don't forget to pull up a stool grab yourself a brew or if you prefer a dram that's entirely up to yourself i don't mind and uh yeah the more the merrier i mean the more people not necessarily the more alcohol uh, joe butler is in the house hello anthony and Tua. my tuesday is much better than usual because i can be with all of you ah oh, lovely stuff it's always a great pleasure to have you uh, on the live streams joe long time no talk which is what i usually say to people when i actually have been speaking to them recently Silve is in county tyrone hope you had a lovely weekend beautiful last few days here near the baymore stones brilliant stuff uh, Silve. yes indeed uh, after the thunderstorms cleared it actually did turn out to be a nice yesterday was lovely today was lovely so we're keeping the fingers crossed that it will continue archaeoastronomy database Greetings, friends. Just made it. Hope you're all well. All in good fettle, it seems. Welcome along, and thank you for all the brilliant work that you're doing. Uh, our man, Amanda Art Artio, is uh, here again from Helsinki. Hello to all our Finnish friends. Uh, Amanda Trenonawa, uh, Folja Roat. Uh, Retro Roman Video Games is listening on the humid rural east coast across the pond in the states wow lovely stuff and uh, you're very welcome hope you enjoy the subject matter tonight robin edgar's in the house haven't seen you in a while robin we are all in the boyne valley but some of us are looking at the stars oscar wilde <laughs> we're all what was the real quote we're all in the gutter but some of us are looking at the stars yes indeed hello robin thank you for the uh, the, the absolutely apt quote for reasons that we'll get on to momentarily paul nethercott is in indian indianapolis uh, and says hello uh, paul a great pleasure uh, one of the few uh, viewers who i've had the pleasure of a face-to-face -face meeting with so there you go 
uh, for reasons that uh, myself and Paul will not be discussing uh, in the immediate future. You'll all have to keep guessing. Um, Kelly is in tropical Florida. Yes, Florida sounds like one of those parts of the states where you want to be most of the time because the weather would be better. It's much further south, of course, and the days don't see the wild swing of the northern states and like we see in Ireland here where the days will be soon in November, the days will be quite short. Um, but where you don't want to be when there's one of those hurricanes whipping up through the Gulf and uh, lashing the hell out of everybody. Yes, in, in Virginia, friends of ancient Ireland, good to hear it. Uh, somebody is saying hello on the Mythical Ireland community. That is Julianne Osborne. Hello, Julianne. Another, by the way, of the viewers uh, who I've had the pleasure of meeting face to face. There aren't that many of you, but there's a few. Coda's getting very excited. He's trying to prompt me. When are we doing the episode about dogs? Snapper Earl said, we just had Tropical Storm Henry pass through during the past two days. So that's the source of our soaking. It's 90 degrees and sunny now, though. Wow. There'll be plenty of growth in the plants, I imagine. Tom King is in the house. Hello, Tom. Yet another of the Tua who I've had the pleasure of a face-to-face -face meeting with. Uh, thank you, Tom. And... Uh, all in fine fettle at the moment anyway. Hope the forge is lit and the dram is topped up and you're ready for a few scaly. Um, uh, Gary, who is the full Irish GK, says, Bannock the great and good to a beautiful day on the sod. I was just looking at Mythflix before your live show, Anto. You really helped me through the lockdown. I owe you one. Well, I, do you know what? It's a, a wonderfully heartening thing to read all of those comments. Uh, I, and the honest truth is that uh, as well as it being an, an, an immense honor and a privilege for me to be able to do it, it actually was very helpful to me as well. We were in, and we are still in, to a large degree, uh, an unprecedented situation that people, you know, naturally, we are a social creature. We're sociable. Most human beings like the company of other human beings. And uh, when the lockdowns came, it, it was difficult for everybody. Um, some more so than others, it was difficult for some people to uh, to deal with that. And this that was one way of helping everybody to deal with it. I'm glad that it had the desired effect. Michael Darby says, morning all. Hope everyone is well. Michael, you must be in Australia or the eastern, the orient or the eastern part of the world. A very good morning to you from what is almost sunset here in the Boyne Valley. Uh, but you're very welcome along. Julianne Osborne has turned up. Oh, obviously on the Mythical Ireland page, because we can now see her name, uh, which we are very glad to display. Lillian Cruz is in the house. Hello, Lillian. Welcome along. Uh, Mo Hurley. Oh, hang on. Wait, 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 wait. Stop, stop, stop. Technology. It's not technology. It's the human. It's, it's, it's entirely me that's at fault here. Mo Hurley. It's barely past noon in S S Sonoma? Sonoma County. Where is that, Mo? Please enlighten us. But you're very welcome along. Uh, where are we? Yes. Uh, Adele says that uh, it's 4 her Oh, my goodness me. It's 4.38 a.m. Lovely surprise. and up early for work. Well, hopefully we'll get you in good form for going to work, uh, Adele. Uh, Guido Bruce is in the house. Good evening, all. And Anthony, the book will be sent to you this week. Brilliant stuff. Excellent. Uh, Guido and uh, Guido has the rare honor because I don't think there are that many, but Guido owns every single one of my published books, including the out of print Land of the Ever Living ones. Bet you're jealous. I do have plans to republish that in a different format. Uh, stay posted is all I can say. Virginia Kavanaugh is in Las Vegas. Very happy to catch a live stream on lunch break for once. Brilliant stuff, Virginia. Uh, nice to meet you, and uh, you're very welcome along to the live stream. Amelia Hubbard is glad to be back, using my lunch to watch this and while grading students' math work. It seems to be a thing that people in the States and certain parts of the States are. It just coincides with their lunch break, and that's really lovely. Yes, you're... Very well. A load of people saying hello to uh, to, to Coda. Tom King says, sir, yes, sir. Now, come on. Now, this isn't a military lineup, Tom. You know, uh, I would be the worst 
commanding officer in history, I promise you. Uh, Movanway Millward says, evening to everybody. A bit late with dinner this evening, so I'm listening as I cook. Hope everyone's well. Brilliant stuff. Hope it's something nice, uh, Movanway. And uh, yeah, you're very welcome. Uh, do you know the origin of the word dog? Serious question. Uh, I don't, but in my library somewhere, I have a very interesting book called Origins, and it's about the origin of words. Would you like me to look it up? Could we distract ourselves for a moment? Uh, it's probably not in it now. Wait, wait, wait till you see. It's probably not in it. We'll see anyway. We'll see very quickly. We'll see. Yes, Gary, I would be very glad to. You know, I'm a bit of a lexicographer, if that's what you call it. I, I like words. I like the English language. I like the Irish language. And I like words and the meaning of them. And I like learning new words, actually. Uh, and uh, I learn a lot of them by, by reading. And it's fascinating. Every day I learn a new word. Dog, hence noun, hence verb, and the adjective doggy. Late Old English, dogga. D O C G A O O O, which is there's loads of abbreviations in these dictionaries, and I don't know what that means, but probably echoic C F the cant boof B U F E and B U F F E R and the mastiffs woof woof to lie doggo from a dog pretending to be asleep with familiar suffix. The adjective dogged refers to bulldogs and mastiffs. Don't know if that helps, doesn't really help me to be honest. Late Old English Dokga, D-O-C-G-A. There you go. And that is from Origins, a short etymological dictionary of modern English, edited by Eric Partridge. Just in case you're interested. All sorts of weird and wonderful stuff on my bookshelves. Mostly wonderful, but definitely some weird. Um, Cynthia Fowler is in Texas. Hello, Cynthia. Always a great pleasure to welcome our Texan friends. Angelica is in Brazil. Hello, Brazil, and good afternoon to you and Daisy and all the other Brazilian watchers. Uh, Michael Darby says, I am all, most certainly in the Antipodes or the Antipodes. <laughs> it's like, yeah, uh, I got a, a fierce slagging one, day, one time uh, when I was a, a cub reporter, when I was quite a young man, and um, I mispronounced a word. What was the word? Uh, it'll come back to me but it was very funny and i do so uh antipodes uh or antipodes uh, but uh basically the, what that means for the uninitiated is uh, the exact opposite side of the world to the place in which you are currently standing so uh the the antipodes or antipodes uh, of ireland are are off new zealand aren't they somewhere in that vicinity Larissa Kama is in the house. Greetings from the great Pacific Northwest. So great to see everyone here on this fine day. And thank you, Anthony, for hosting another wonderful Mythical Ireland Book Talk. I, it, it is my absolute pleasure to do so, Larissa. And it's made all the more pleasurable by the number of people who watch from various different parts of the world. It is greatly heartening. Nula Doyle is in the house. Connoisseur to to Nula. And uh, make yourself... Uh, feel at home. Donna Jean Porter is in North Texas. Is Ireland in lockdown again? No, we are experiencing a significant surge in cases and hospital cases and um, intensive care cases, but fingers crossed, touch wood, touch anything that comes to hand. We are not uh, and have not had uh, deaths from COVID for I don't think we've had any deaths in the past week or maybe a couple of weeks. The case numbers are very high, but because our vaccination uptake has been very high, uh, which is brilliant, by the way. If, if, if you went by Facebook and social media, you would think that nobody was getting vaccinated and everybody was against it. But that's only because the anti-vaccine crowd are, seem to shout the loudest. Thankfully, in Ireland, most people are sensible. We want to see the back of this thing and we want to look after each other. So uh, it is making a big, big difference. Uh, not to politicise the live stream. And uh, let's just leave that there because I know that will open cans. I guarantee you later on on YouTube, somebody will make a, a, a comment, a derogatory comment about me about uh, in relation to the vaccines. But anyway, 
I, I don't mind. They can make all the comments they want. I'm fully vaccinated and I'm proud to say that I'm looking after myself and my family and all of those who may not be able to survive COVID if they did not have a vaccine. Serious question. Huh? <laughs> oh, yes, about the dog, <laughs> the dog star. Oh, I see what you did there. What did the pig say when he left hospital? This is Tom King's joke. I'm cured. <laughs> uh, brilliant. Uh, Sile is saying, as uh, was uh, why he's coming to the. Uh, all I can say is thank you, but sure, it is it is the community that helps to make it. Really, it is, uh, and uh, the lovely interaction that has been a hallmark of the whole thing from day one. Uh, Donna J. Moyers is in Connecticut in the U.S. We're we're fast approaching having all the states represented here this evening. The whole eastern seaboard of Australia is in lockdown. Yes, um, it just seems to be surging here and there. Look, this thing's going to rock on for a while. The way it, the simple thing is that, as you know, the more people who get vaccinated the, and, and fast, the sooner this will all be over, you know. Tara Tinder is happy to hear something. I can't remember. Was that Tom's joke? Um, hang on now till I see if I can rustle something up. I, I'm a, I've got a terrible memory for jokes now, and I think it's because of social media. When I was a young adult, I could sit for an hour non-stop and tell you memorize jokes uh, at least i could probably sit and, and entertain you for to entertain is a broad term you might find these jokes funny um let me let me let me, let me see um i'm just not remembering one so i have to read one from my facebook uh, feed yes the other day at cadbury's lorry and a lego truck collided on the m50 that's the motorway around dublin city the police the guardy that's the irish police were asking motorists to avoid the area because the road was chock-a-block. <sighs> I just finished building a car using a motor from a washing machine. I'm going to take it for a spin later. Ah, yes, Tara, on the, the vaccines, yes. I know it's a divisive subject, but it shouldn't be divisive. It's really straightforward. We all look after each other and, and it'll be soon. Did you hear what happened to the rainbow that broke the law? They put it in prison. It was a light sentence. <laughs> well, I like it. I like it. <laughs> 10 out of 10. Uh, Neil Hughes uh, says, Trenonoa from Coatbridge in Scotland. Oh, oh, this must be... This this is Neil just woken up from his nap due to serious lack of fee on Jarug. Hang on a second. You woke up from your nap due to a lack of yeah, I suppose that makes a sort of certain amount of twisted sense. Uh, I would have said enough red wine would send you to sleep. But anyway, good evening to Neil and to Mary, and uh, good to hear at least that you're with us. You know the jokes. Yes, don't 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 encourage me. No, seriously, but. How do you get a tissue to dance? What a little, I presume that means put a, put a little boogie in it. <laughs> or a bogey, as we call it. Yes, indeed. Oh, oh my God. What time is it? Oh, it could not be. Really? Okay. I, I, I do apologize. Due to the addition of some jokes, some humor, uh, we are late starting. And, uh, well, due to the fact there are so many people saying, Hello, and that this is part of the whole experience of live Irish myths. No, it's not live Irish myths, Anthony. Stop saying that. It's book talk. Get it into your thick skull. Tonight, I am reading from what is a 2006. 2000, see, see what I did there? 2006. 2003, I was right in the first place. A 2003 facsimile reprint of Sir William Wilde's book. The Beauties of the Boyne and Blackwater. Just to explain, uh, the Blackwater is a tributary river of the River Boyne. It enters, it joins with the Boyne River in the town of Navan in County Meath. Navan is about 
I, I always say miles, about 14 miles west of us here. So if you if you if you were to venture up the Boyne River, you would go through the Slane village, first of all, after you leave Drahada, of course, you would come to Slane and then to Navan and then to Trim. But at Navan, uh, the Blackwater uh, joins. And the Blackwater is a tributary that runs past the ancient uh, Lunasa festival site of Tel Telta and Talje. And onwards up towards Loch Ramor, which is actually in the very southern part of County Cavan. Uh, Coda is uh, very uh, animated about something. Uh, it may have been uh, due to a, a family celebration yesterday. Um, one of the uh, items on the menu was a copious amount of cocktail sausages. And let's just say that Coda did get one or two or three or four or a few more of those. A um, little introduction to uh, the book and to Sir William Wilde. Sir William Wilde uh, was born in 1815 and died in 1876. Was an extraordinary man by any standards. A surgeon at 24 years, he founded the first eye and ear hospital in Dublin, which made him famous throughout Europe and the USA. He always had a deep interest in archaeology, becoming vice president of the Royal Irish Academy. His reputation as a writer brought him further acclaim, which included such books as A Voyage to Madeira and the Mediterranean, Loch Corrib, Its Shores and Islands, with notices of Loch Mask, and The Beauties of the Boyne and Blackwater. Later still, he catalogued the antiquities of the Royal Irish Museum. He was knighted in 1864 for his services to statistical science. I should also say that at the time he was in the Royal Irish Academy, he catalogued what would eventually become the collection that was handed over to the uh, National Museum of Ireland when it was established. Uh, and uh, you will see many of those items today. If you've ever been to the National Museum, for instance, and you have seen the Tara brooch, the Tara brooch was one of the items, many, many items catalogued by uh, Sir William Wilde. Throughout his life, he spent his holidays at his ancestral home at Moitura, Kong, County Mayo, the site of the first mythological battle of Moitura, overlooking his beloved Loch Corrib. He died at his home at number one Merrion Square, Dublin, aged only 61 years. A commemorative plaque is attached to the wall of the house with the following inscription, oral and ophthalmic surgeon, archaeologist, ethnologist, antiquarian, biographer, statist, statistician, <laughs> naturalist, topographer, historian, folklorist. A truly great man. A truly great man whose reputation wasn't entirely without Sully, I might add. This book was written by Sir William Wilde in 1849, just at the, not, not at the peak of, or just towards the end of the famine. Did the famine really ever end? It didn't end for a long time for a lot of people. And gives an exhaustive account of the antiquities along the Boyne Valley and its contributory river, the Blackwater, which flows through counties Kildare. Uh, well, this is this is the, the Boyne. Kildare, Meath, Louth and Cavan. Well, Cavan would be the, the Blackwater. Along its banks are countless ruined forts, castles, abbeys, cairns, tumuli, including Newgrange, Nowth and Douth. Here too took place the famous Battle of the Boyne, and a battlefield map is supplied. All are graphically described and illustrated with 84 woodcut engravings. Now, after 150 years, this marvellous book is reprinted with a facsimile of the original second edition. What had become a collector's item is now available to all readers. William Wilde, who was father of poet, or playwright, and novelist Oscar Wilde, was one of the most renowned antiquarians of his day, as well as being a historian of note, a naturalist and the founder of the first eye and ear hospital in Dublin. And uh, it was actually uh, uh, republished. Uh, uh, I'm not sure if it's actually st still widely available by Kevin Duffy, Headfirst County Galway, which is the inscription on the new sort of inside uh, page. Now I have to choose a section to read. Uh, who is that that's saying hello on Facebook? Give me one second. Can I find out? That's Karen Gogus. Hello, Karen. Welcome along. Good to see you. Mark Gordon is here as well. Hello, Mark. Welcome to the live stream. Michael is a, a Texan. No need to listen on my phone, though, as Donna Jean Porter always plays you at full volume. Ah, I see. Yeah, good. Yeah, good. Well, there's no, no difficulty with being heard then. Elaine Cooney's in the house. No brown zone, Elaine. We haven't actually started reading yet, so you're grand. 
yes, the jokes. Uh, yes, Diana is laughing out loud in her kitchen. I definitely, definitely would not uh, offer words of encouragement because you're liable to just uh, encourage me to, 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 uh, you know, to give you more jokes. Uh, now, yeah, I'll read from chapter one, which is about the boy, and we'll see how we get on. We might read a little bit about Tara. We might read a little bit about Bruno Bonia as well. If everybody's comfortable, it's half past eight. It's high time I got the hell on with it and stopped waffling. Among the many scenes of beauty and of interest with which this fair island abounds, he's not wrong there, we know of none which combines such variety of the former or so many objects of the latter as the, quote, pleasant boyne, unquote. And although this river does not burst upon us amidst the wild and stern grandeur of the mountains, with dashing torrent or leaping in its rapid course all the barriers of nature, or making its echoes heard among the deep hollows of dark wooded dells, but pursues the quiet even tenor of its way through a flat but rich and fertile country, winding by its own secret will. It doesn't have the word secret there. I just added that in. Its own sweet will through broad savannas and by green inches, where the calm ripple of its placid waters disturbs not the song of the Mavis. Still, it possesses charms and beauties, and that too without a rival in this or perhaps any other country. And in, in the, the immediate sense that we get here is that uh, th that Wilde uh, and uh, Robert Lloyd Prager uh, may have been cut from the same cloth. Uh, they they were both uh, what you might call polymaths with a significant interest in you know archaeology, history, anthropology, the landscape, etc., geology, and uh, both sort of taking a stroll through the countryside. And describing everything that they see and hear uh, along the way. Slow, oh uh, yes, so Robert Lloyd Prager's book was called The Way That I Went and we did an episode on that quite recently if you go back a few episodes. Slow, calm and tranquil in its early course, the mower whets his scythe in the deep meadows by its brink and the reaper gathers the corn from the very margin of its waters. The swift and the martin skim over its clear surface, and the robin sings in the ancient thorn that rises out of the adjoining hedgerow. The very mayfly, as it lights upon it, breaks the mirror of its surface. The wide-spreading circles which mark the springing of the trout or the timid breathing of the roach are all save the flapping of the water hen or the easy paddle of the bald coot that disturb its placid bosom. Fantastic stuff. Who's slipping in a bit late? Rowan Grove, that's perfectly okay. We've just literally started the reading now because there was uh, lots of introductions and a few <clears throat> <coughs> jokes. Mm. In this gentle stream, there is no inequality, no roar of waters, nor spray of cataract. If, if, if you happened to get your hands on a copy of uh, Mythical Ireland monograph number two, uh, Bowen, the goddess of the River Boyne and the Milky Way. Uh, you may recognize the forthcoming because I quoted it in the introduction in the first chapter of this uh, monograph because I thought it was just such a beautifully poetic uh, description of the Boyne. By the way, I should say that uh, there are plenty of copies. I ran out and I got a second print run. Uh, so thanks to uh, my local printer, Anglo Printers, who do a great job on all my uh, self-published work. Uh, so uh, they can be ordered via the website. That's mythicalireland.com. So I'll start that again, because this is, this is I think this is beautiful stuff. So Wilde wasn't just a surgeon and, um, and an antiquarian. Uh, he, he was a hell of a good writer. In this gentle stream, there is no inequality, no roar of waters, nor spray of cataract. It is not boisterous, nor yet sluggish, neither broken by the sudden rapid, nor calmed by spreading into the broad lake. But pure and undefiled, it springs from the crystal fountain of the living rock, its source sanctified by religious veneration, and commemorated in legend and in song, 
serene and peaceful. Like a true philosopher, it glides noiselessly on in deep but calm repose, bestowing the blessings of fertility on the counties through which it flows, bearing on its bosom the intercourse which socialises man, enriching, beautifying and civilising. It receives in return the homage of its tributaries and finally mingles with that eternity of waters, the sea. Fabulously, beautifully poetic uh, piece of writing. As Clutterbuck says of his story in The Fortunes of Nigel, commencing strikingly, proceeding naturally, ending happily, like the course of a famed river which gushes from the mouth of some obscure and romantic grotto, then gliding on, never pausing, never precipitating its course, visiting, as it were, by natural instinct, whatever worthy objects of interest are presented by the country through which it passes. Winding through the heart of the ancient kingdom of Meath, green homesteads, picturesque villages, peaceful hamlets, and thriving towns rise on its banks. The hand of man has turned its power to good account, and mills and factories draw their animation from its waters. The freights of foreign lands, the luxuries of far distant countries, are borne on its stream towards the interior, and the produce of our own soil and the industry of our people is carried downwards on its tide. Deep hanging woods and rich plantations of noble parks and extensive demeans, where the willows dip into its calm waters and the oaks and elms of centuries are mirrored in the wave beneath, stretched for miles along its course, where, quote, slow and in soft murmurs, nature bade it flow, unquote. Have to have to add a slight touch of cynicism there and to say that in 1849, I doubt that you would have found too many thriving towns and picturesque villages and peaceful hamlets at the height of the Great Famine. But anyway, perhaps an overly romanticised view from somebody who perhaps wasn't quite uh, suffering from the ill effects of that uh, Great Famine. Towards its centre, and as it nears the sea, its banks become more elevated, their outline more picturesque. Here, rising abruptly from the water's edge, their castled crags bending over the stream remind us of the scenery that characterizes the Rhine between Cologne and uh, Mayence. In other places, slope, sloping gradually from the river, their sides are clothed with foliage of the deepest, darkest green, piled up in waving leafy masses to their very summits, so that the sun itself is hidden, except at noon, in many places from its dark waters. The summits of many of these verdant banks are crown, crowned by ruins of castles, towers and churches, feudal halls and high baronial keeps, still noble even in their decay, and forming, as they are cut clear and sharp against the azure blue beyond, pictures in the landscape unsurpassed in grace and beauty by any in the land. In the broad lawns that here and there interpose between these verdant banks and steep or hanging precipices, we find the noble mansions of some of the highest of our nobility and many of the most memorable ecclesiastical remains, the cell of the hermit, the cloister of the monk, and the cross of the pilgrim, that Ireland, rich as she is in relics of the past, can boast of. Ancient stone circles, massive cromlechs, and numerous green mounds raised by our pagan ancestors, some clothed with velvet sward, but others fringed with young plantations, are thickly interspersed among the more attractive objects that catch the eye as it descends upon the limpid surface of the boyne. And I think limpid is just another word for clear, isn't it? transparent. Highly cultivated lands, richly ornamented seats, and a population, generally speaking, more comfortable, more intelligent, and more advanced in civilization than the majority of our peasantry. Clearly, he's absolutely writing for a particular audience. 
not the peasantry, who are all dying of starvation, may fill up the outline we have faintly and briefly endeavoured to draw of the general characteristics and present appearance of the celebrated river. And though Spencer has not sung its praises, nor Raleigh gossiped upon its banks, it has been hallowed by events the most interesting in our country's annals. So memorable in ancient history and so rich in monuments of the past is it that we fear not to assert that the history of Ireland might be written in tracing its banks, and that is supremely true. Many a broad, smiling plain through which it flows, now green with waving corn, or perfumed and decorated by the wild flowers of a pasture land, or by some delicate female hand cultivated into the elegant garden, in the bowers of which the birds of spring are singing, was once the scene of mortal strife, and crimsoned with the blood of warriors, where the clang of battle the shout of the victorious, the groan of the dying, and the prayer of the supplicant alone were heard. Scarcely a ford upon this river, but was disputed in days gone by. Every pass was a thermopylae. The bardic annals teem with descriptions of its battles. The fairy lore of other days yet lingers by its tranquil waters. And scarcely a knoll or mound or rock or bank in its vicinity, but still retains its legend. The peasant even yet paddles his curragh, or frail canoe of skins, across its waters, and many of the superstitious rites and customs of our ancestors are still observed by the people of that district. How time runs on, and science widens the circle of her power, Yet man and many of his customs remain the same for centuries. On one side of the bridge of Drogheda may still be seen the wicker Curra. Uh, Curra, 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 as he has it, he has it spelled here, C-O-R-R-A-G-H. And uh, if, if you want more about the ancient Curra, Curragh, uh, Clive Gibney's website uh, about the Boyne Curragh or Coracle is, is a brilliant resource because he's still making them. With its horse skin covering, the same in design and execution, perhaps, as floated there a thousand years ago. And on the other, we find the latest invented and most improved screw steamer. There you go. And recently, of course, this year, uh, some medieval log boats. And the same could be said about those that are still sitting in the bed of the River Boyne in Drogheda. That the, des the design of them scarcely changed for centuries. Michael Darby says he certainly could write. Yeah, he's definitely. I mean, he, 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 it's 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 a it's powerful stuff. It's it's fabulous prose. It has to be said, uh, even though, as I said, he may have been looking looking at it through rose tinted glasses. Uh, you know, the aristocracy maybe did not just fully appreciate everything that was going on in the eighteen forties. I could be wrong. The plains of Meja and the flowery fields of Breya through which the Boyne flows, appear to have been the first cultivated in Ireland. And it is more than probable that one of the earliest waves of population which reached our island passed up the stream of this great river, and that the Aborigines settled amidst the wooded hills and deep alluvial plains upon its banks, and have left their bones in the numerous barrows and tumuli still remaining upon its shores. Beyond all doubt, the earliest undoubted kings of Erin reigned upon its banks, where also the earliest laws were framed, the earliest poems sung, and the most profound druidical mysteries celebrated. Soldiers and sages, bards and brahans, have commemorated many of its localities. The romance of Irish history is laid amidst the scenery of this river, and much of the imagery of our earliest poets was drawn from this fertile source and not just the earliest ones but the modern the contemporary day ones too christianity entered ireland through this sacred stream patrick first landed at the boyne's mouth and raised the beacon of the cross at slain his first sermons were preached and his first conversations took place quote where in delightful streams the boyne the darling of the ocean flows unquote
Hmm, that's from Bishop Ushers. I think it's Usher anyway. Uh, he was the f one who famously said that the world was only 6,000 years old and that the earth had been created, was it 4004 BC, something like that? Foreign invaders, the Dane and the Norseman, first entered this kingdom on its waters. The earliest abodes of learning and the most renowned schools of Christian philosophy, which our analysts record, had their seats by its margin. Parliaments and councils were held in its castles, and kingdoms in battles fought by kings were lost and won upon its banks. These are not the fanciful speculations of the enthusiastic but imaginary writers of the last century. The monuments speak for themselves. Their architecture tells their date and purpose. Actually, in 1849, they did not know that Newgrange was actually Neolithic and was more than 5,000 years old. Many of the historic annals which relate these circumstances, formerly difficult of access and known or capable of being understood but by a few, have been recently published in the English tongue and have satisfied even the most incredulous as to their antiquity and authenticity. It is acknowledged by all capable of forming an opinion on the subject that the history of Ireland has yet to be written, but the materials for it are now being collected and rendered accessible and instructive by competent authorities with an interest and an enthusiasm, and moreover, with a critical regard to the simple and unbiased statement of the authors, alike honourable to the country and creditable to those engaged in the production of these works. We are not vain enough to boast of, nor credulous enough to believe, all that is related in many of the early Irish manuscripts. No more than we place implicit faith in all that is told in the great Grecian epic, or that historians have set down in the primitive histories of other kingdoms. But we receive them as shadows of great historical events and as highly characteristic of the manners and customs of the times and people they describe. And it may be here remarked that so far from critical investigation or research invalidating the testimony of our early Irish bards and analysts, it has been found and every day's experience confirms the fact that the more we collate, examine and compare manuscript with manuscript, author with author, and both with those monuments and antiquities which have still remained undefaced. And the more we test them with, with contem contemporaneous history, the more the shadow will be found to correspond with the substance of the truth they figure. And he has a footnote here that says, I'm sorry, my neck is itchy. <laughs> we know no better proof of this statement than Mr. Petrie's essay on the history and, and antiquities of Tara Hill published in the transactions of the Royal Irish Academy. This is the age of true eclectic investigation. What would he make of today's methods of science and archaeology and carbon dating and genomic DNA testing and all that stuff? The country, notwithstanding all her present poverty and privation, oh, it seems he did actually realise there was something going on out, outside his door, is not only ripe for its reception, but cries loudly for her history. It is a fact strange but true that either from prejudice, apathy or indifference, while the histories of Greece, Rome, England and Scotland are taught, or at least boys are com compelled to read them, at the schools for the sons of the Irish gentry and middle classes, the history of Ireland, such as it is, is never heard of. Interesting. So he does apparently have some slight empathy for the uh, the, uh, the ordinary folk. Desiree Riley is in the house. Hello, Desiree. Uh, I'm reading uh, Desiree. It's uh, a modern facsimile reprint of Sir William Wilde's uh, The Beauties of the Boyne and Blackwater, first published in 1849. And Sir William Wilde was father of Oscar Wilde, who you may have heard of, a very famous writer. Um, Brendan Byrne is in the house. No brown zone, Brendan. You're very welcome along. How's life down in the Glen? Hope it's nice and sunny. Well, not right now because the sun's gone down, but I hope you had a nice day down there. 
in the historical remarks which we purpose introducing in order to illustrate the Boyne, it cannot be expected that in a popular work of this description we should break the text and stay the narrative by interlacing its page with critical references to all the various sources of Irish history from which we have drawn these materials. Neither is it our intention to describe minutely all the geographical relations and various industrial resources of this river, but to present a series of picturesque views from those points in which its scenic beauty is most remarkable, and particularly to draw the attention of the tourist and young, young antiquary to those localities which are memorable for their historical recollections or venerated for their archaeological interest. And, as we have already stated, no other river in Ireland affords the same scope for the study of these objects combined with the same variety and extent of pastoral inland scenery, of such depth of colour and such grace of outline as the Boyne for at least 30 miles of its course. In proof of our assertion with regard to the numerous monuments upon the Boyne, we may remark that from Trim to Drogheda, we have traces of every epoch of Irish history, from the ante-historic period, the date of which carries us back to the primeval occupation of this island, and which is indelibly marked by the pagan Cromlech, the rude cell and altar, and the stone chamber or kistvine with its surrounding mound containing rude rude earthen urns the incinerated bones the shell ornaments the stone weapons of our fervolugant to a to a ancestors together with their circular wraths and entrenched military forts of which we have examples in the mounds and tumuli at carberry clonard ard mulcan Newgrange, Douth, Knockmanon, and Brunabonia. Uh, for a description of the Furvolugs and Thuadadanans, see the ethnolo ethnological inquiry at the end of this volume after the account of Douth. Okay. Here we may linger, and here's a quote from Speranza. By the Cromlech sloping downward, where the Druids victim bled, by those towers pointing sunward, Hieroglyphics none have read. In their mystic symbols seeking of past creeds and rites overthrown. If the truths they shined are speaking yet in litanies of stone. Unquote. The sacred well from which the river flows with its half fabulous legends serves to connect the earliest historic period with preceding times and marks a period shrouded in mystery and druidism. I can imagine Glendalough was lovely there today. Tara with its leofoil or oracular stone and its grassy mounds stands alone, the crowning place of its kings, the forum of the sages and the banqueting hall of the nobles of Erin, at least 18 centuries ago. Then follow the early Christian buildings, the oratories and small missionary churches, sculptured crosses, carved fonts and round towers, as at Monaster, Monaster Oris, Clonard, Donamore and St. Dirk. Uh, Donamore being just outside Navan in County Meath. Over, it's not quite overlooking the Boyne. You can't really see the Boyne from it. Uh, but very close to the Boyne, till such primitive buildings rose into the more stately edifices, churches and monasteries of Slain, Trim, Bective and Drogheda. Yes, my own town. The baronial halls of the Anglo-Normans and proud castles of the Pale stretching along its banks and commanding every ford and pass as at Carberry, Trim, Athlumney, Dunmo and Castle Dexter. Mark another era and tell of the extended sway of the De Lacy's, Hussies, Birmingham's, Plunkett's, Cusack's, Barnwell's, Fleming's, Preston's, Pettit's, Tutes, Darcy's, and other English chieftains from the time of the invasion to the age of Elizabeth. Although we do not find any well-authenticated architectural remains of the uh, Omelachlans, the ancient monarchs of Meath, 
still remaining. Their written history enables us to note with tolerable precision the strongholds and fortresses, as well as the sites of the abbeys and churches founded by this memorable and ill-fated race. Ruins that still remain the footprints of history with, quote, ivied arch and pillar lone, pleading haughtily for glories gone, unquote. I was just looking at that name, Omelachlins. I mean, I presume that's, uh, uh, he's, he's referring to Mael Shachlan, uh, the High King of Ireland around the turn of the last millennium, uh, around the late 900s, the early 1000s AD. The various holy wells sheltered by the ancient oaks and thorns and alike venerated by the druid priest and the early Christian saint and pilgrim occur in spots so calm, so lone and peaceful that religious veneration is there awakened even in the most apathetic. The town of Drogheda notes a, a memorable era in the time of Cromwell and its numerous military and ecclesiastical remains extend over a period of undoubted authenticity for at least 1,000 years. The site and story of the Battle of the Boyne on that memorable occasion when, for the last time, two kings fought for the sovereignty of these realms brings us down to a date almost within the memory of man. While the monster, that's a, a 1690, by the way, is the date of the Battle of the Boyne, and 1649, was the date of Cromwell's storming of the walls of Drogheda, uh, September the 11th. Drogheda's 9-11, it's often been described as 1649. While the monster meeting at Tara, the last great effort of O'Connell and the moral force repealers, occurred but a few years ago. Of course, as I said, uh, Wilde is writing this in 18, publishing in 1849. And yet with all this, we know of no river that has been more neglected by writers and no scenery that is less known within the same distance of the metropolis than that which the Boyne presents for the greater portion of its course. The modern writers upon Ireland have one and all carefully avoided it. Inglis encircled Ireland, but did, did the Boyne while the northern mail whirled him over the bridge of Drogheda. I was just thinking, I had to think about that for a second. Uh, well, the Northern Mail world must have been a mail coach. Um, is this, you see, I'm not sure about when the second edition, this is a facsimile of the second edition, the Boyan Viaduct, which carries the Dublin Belfast railway line, uh, only began to be constructed in 1849 and was completed in 1855. So when he, when he says that uh, Inglis, uh, was whirled over the bridge of Drogheda uh, by the northern mail. I, I presume he's talking about a mail coach rather than a mail train, a horse, uh, a, a, a horse uh, uh, drawn uh, coach of some kind. Barrow no sooner approached its waters than he fled from them in dismay. The angler in Ireland appears to have omitted it by particular desire. And with the exception of Mr. and Mrs. Hall's account of its appearance at Trim, it has remained unnoticed and undescribed by all modern systematic writers upon the scenery of this portion of the British dominions. Dr. Petrie, who first drew attention, that's George Petrie, to its beauties in a short paper published in the last volume of those valuable records of Irish history, the Penny Journals, thus graphically describes a portion of this river. It is of a character as beautiful as could be found anywhere or even be imagined. Scenery of this class of equal richness may be often found in England, but we do not know of any river's course of the same length in which natural beauty so happily combines or in which so many interesting memorials of past ages could be found. Scattered in rich profusion along the banks of this beautiful river, we find the noblest monuments of the various races of men who have held sway in Ireland. It is on its luxuriant banks, amid so many instructive memorials of past ages, that the history of our country, as traced in its monuments, could best be studied. Um, Michael, uh, Michael Darby is offering to make everybody tea and coffee. There you go, good man, Michael. And I hope nobody's on, in for any of those fancy sort of salted caramel latte mocha yogami buzzers. 
cappuccino thingies. I hope it's just just tea. Uh, Julianne Osborne is suffering from a severe case of library envy. Yeah, it is. In fairness, uh, it has taken me a long time to build it up, and uh, I'm glad to say that as uh, time goes on, I'm spending more time in it. I've been doing an awful lot of reading and an awful of an awful lot of writing lately, and less taking photographs and doing live streams. I have to admit. Sorry, where was I? Nor will our readers cavil at this broad assertion when they remember the various remains which we have enumerated and the great and numerous historic events to which we have alluded, while from among the ruins with which it abounds and underneath the very sod turned up by the spade of the labourer in the vast and fertile plains of Leinster traversed by the Boyne, a mine of Irish antiquities has been and is daily being worked which has largely assisted to stock the museums of our own and other countries. He may there, by the, by the way, be referring to the gold uh, items found at Newgrange in, I think it was 1842, uh, which later became known as the Coiningham Collection, now residing in the British Museum. Stone weapons, hatchets, knives and arrowheads of various shapes and sizes, bronze, celts, swords and spearheads, terracotta vases, golden torques, rings, bracelets, and ornaments of great value, and of the most beautiful forms, musical instruments of brass, rings, pins, and fibulae of silver, knives, swords, axes, shears, and domestic utensils of iron, combs and pins of bone and wood, besides other warlike culinary or decorative implements and ornaments of the early people of Ireland have been here found in rich profusion. Here, moreover, may the naturalist speculate on the various races of the extinct animals of this country, the gigantic elk, almost peculiar to Ireland, the antlered stag, the noble wolf dog, the different varieties of horned cattle and domestic animals, whose remains are found in its bogs and marshes, or of fowl and other small animals occasionally discovered among the incinerated bones in the urns and tumuli, where also the ethnologist may procure ample means for study and speculation. Shrines, bells and croziers of the most chaste form and moulding, to many of which an undoubted authentic history is attached, have likewise been discovered in this rich locality. If the remains of plants and animals fixed in the enduring rocks mark for the geologist epochs of time, convulsions of nature, transition periods, and great physical revolutions on the surface of our globe, how much more do the weapons, ornaments, and tombs with their contents and architectural remains afford the antiquary and historian a means of ascertaining with much greater precision their historic epochs, and of forming an acquaintance with the habits, manners, and customs, the religion, arts, music, sports, and warfare of the people to whom such antiquities belonged. I'm keeping just reading. I think this is fabulous. I'm just going to keep reading. I'm not going to jump. Donna Fur is in the house. Hello, Donna. Welcome along. You're, you're very good to join us. Moreover, along the Boyne and its tributaries, may the angler enjoy good sport with both, both trout and salmon, and the botanist reap a plenteous harvest, plenteous harvest of some of the richest and rarest plants peculiar to the inland districts of Ireland. Let us wander together by the banks of the Boyne when the sun is high in heaven, when the warm air of summer is around us, the trees still green with the foliage of spring and musical with the notes of birds and the kine stand in the ford, splashing in the stream which quietly ripples by them. Then when the cuckoo revels in the grove and the rail crakes in the meadow, while the perfume of the thorn still lingers about the hedgerows and the dragonfly is flitting to and fro among the flaggers by the water's edge, let us wend our way along its peaceful margins. Such has been the character of the scene and such the impressions made upon us. 
when the notes from which this little work has been compiled were written down. And as such, we would present it to our readers and describe it from our summer recollections, when piles of the richest, richest foliage were shadowed in the deep pools of the placid waters, when the lark caroled high above us, and the long, calm twilight of midsummer, with all its poetic associations, induced us to linger amidst these lovely scenes of beauty, fairy legend, and historic interest. As the season has advanced, the scene is changed over all the land. The corn has been gathered in and now stands in well-built stacks round the snug homestead. The stream has filled up its brinks and spread partly onto the adjoining meadows, while its surface is ruffled by the fitful gusts of the October blast or thrown into bubbles by the heavy patter of the passing shower of this autumnal April. The various shades of green which decked the forest and plantation have given place to the glowing orange or the more sombre russet tints of umber and sienna. The haws have crimsoned the hedges and the leaves are falling fast and rustling into nooks and crannies for shelter. Occasional gleams of bright sunshine give at times the glow of warmth to the landscape, but they nevertheless forebode the shower or herald in the rainbow. A few of the early trees have already become stripped of their foliage and form graceful studies for the student of nature, who, if he would excel in painting trees with their foliage on, should study the, the anatomy of the leafless branches with as much care as the figure painter devotes to the dry bones of the skeleton. The lapwing wheels and peewits over the dreary moor, and clouds of field fairs and starlings appear in the distance as if gathering for the winter's campaign. But whether it be early spring with all its morning freshness and elasticity, or sultry summer or yellow autumn, there is still the same sylvan beauty, the ever-changing tints which the green foliage, the graceful undulation of surface, the glancing river and the picturesque ruin impart to the landscape of the British Isles. Nowhere else to be met with, whereon the, the eye never wearies, the mind never palls, and of which the memory never loses sight. Of course, back in 1849, uh, you know, uh, Ireland uh, was part of the empire. Or at least for a, a, a certain amount of people it was. As this is the great river of Meath, a few observations on the, that ancient province may not be out of place. Under the denomination me, this and he spells it a number of different ways. M E A T H M E T H M I D E M E D I A or M E I D H E, and in part that of Moybray was formerly included in a far wider and more extensive territory than that comprised in the present county of this name. The district included under this title is one of the most level and fertile in the kingdom, and originally stretched from the interior of the island to the sea. Hence, Camden and other English writers derive its name of media. Ptolemy places the, the Labarus, or ancient central castle and city of this kingdom, in the territory of Meath, but antiquaries are as yet undecided whether the present Kells, Tara, or Kellare Castle occupies the site of that memorable spot. The la latter of those, Kellare Castle, uh, would have been located right next to the hill of Ishnach, so it makes sense that Ishnach being in the centre of the country, uh, Kellare being right next to it, that it might have been the centre of the country. Though Tara seems obviously the place intended by the great geographer, whose transcribers and commentators in all probability mistook the word Tavarus for Labarus. Not sure about that. Uh, I have uh, some of Miranda Aldhaus Green's work, Neil. Um, to be honest, yes, I have read, but have I read it recently? Is No is probably the answer. Something I must perhaps consider for one of the forthcoming episodes. I don't have, uh, I don't think, uh, Beresford Ellis's mammoth book of Celtic myths and legends. I don't think. Um, I think I'd know every volume that was on the shelves, wouldn't you? Um, or what was I doing there? 
uh, checking just to make sure I'm not missing any. Michael Pike uh, is saying such details of life around us, historical views. Yes, indeed, absolutely. And it's still the same. I mean, there's a lot more urban development. Um, you know, uh, spoils it a little bit, but uh, the, the river still does remain intensely scenic along much of its route. There is an ancient tradition handed down through our manuscripts that the Fervolugs or the Belgae, as they've been termed, first settled in this locality. And it is not at all improbable that a rude and primitive people living by hunting and fishing, such as we may suppose the early inhabitants of this country were, would, upon their arrival on the northeastern shores of Ireland, seek the interior through the noble stream that traversed this great plain, where the woods and forest glades afforded plenty of game, the waters abundance of fish, and, in process of time, as civilization advanced, its fertile limestone soil returned a plenteous crop, and its luxuriant pastures produced numerous herds of cattle. The old writer uh, Bartholomeus Anglicus, as quoted by Camden, described it as, quote, a soil which yields plenty of wheat and pastures, well stocked with herds, abounding with fish, flesh and other provisions, butter, cheese and milk, and well watered by rivers. The situation of it is delightful and the air healthy. And this is a continuation of that quote. The woods and marshes in its extremities defend its approaches. And from the number of people, the strength of its castles and towns, and the peace which it enjoys in consequence thereof, it is commonly called the Chamber of Ireland, unquote. The first fortified houses and stone buildings that we read of were in Meath. And in this case, he has a footnote that we do not mean castles. Interesting. The earliest chronological era to which the most voracious of the modern Irish historians refer is about the middle or towards the end of the second century when Toal Tectmar, one of the Scotic or Milesian pagan monarchs, reigned at Tara. He, erect, he erected Meath into a fifth province as mensal lands or appanage for the monarchy by taking in portions from each of the other four. Hence, the Irish historians derive its name of Mie, M-E-I-D-H-E, a neck on account of its being formed by necks taken from the surrounding districts or provinces. The fact of the gospel having been first preached and received in Meath is a proof of its civilization in comparison with the other parts of the island at that period. And the immediate reception and rapid extension of the Christian doctrine among the kings and nobles assembled on the banks of the Boyne on St. Patrick's arrival speaks loudly for the state of education in Ireland at that time. Uh, it's more, the, more to do with the propagation, the speed of propagation of uh, uh, folklore. If the gospel came to Ireland in the 5th century and was received, as it was stated to have been, and we have every reason to believe it was, then indeed the tone of the bards and analysts who describe the high state of the arts and who place such noble sentiments in the mouths of our kings and chieftains at that time is not as vaunting as some critics have supposed. The province or kingdom of Meath, as established by Thoal, extended from Dublin to the Shannon and from the centre of Ireland to the sea and included both East and West Meath with portions of Dublin, Kings County, Longford and Cavan. A part of it was then styled My Bray, the Magnificent Plain, or the Campus Brigantium of Dr. O'Connor and other authors. The Owen Ree, the King's River, now called the Rye Water, was the boundary of this region on the one side and the Casson in Louth on the other. I think that's uh, where um, the river, that river runs into the Irish Sea at uh, uh, Ballinagasson or Anagasson on the Louth coast. It is thus described in an old Irish ron, a ron being like a, 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 a rhyme or a poem. From Loch Bogerig to Burr, from the Shannon east to the sea, to Cor Clonia Irarge and to Cor Clonia Ard. Unquote. The ancient manuscripts 
are very rich in the topographical descriptions of this district. And of course, we will know that from our episodes of live Irish myths, especially those dealing with the Denshanachus. It was the great, it was, sorry, it was the seat of Irish monarchy for some centuries after its erection into a province. And one of our oldest coins is that of Aid, King of Meath. There were four royal palaces of great note and celebrity in this province in ancient times. At Tara on the Boyne, Tulchin on the Blackwater, Clochta on the Hill of Ward near Athboy, and Ishnach in Westmeath. Sylvester Geraldus Cambrensis thus describes this portion of the Pentarchy. We, we did a, an episode about uh, Gerald of Wales or Geraldus Cambrensis. Quote, there arrived in Ireland five brethren that were valiant and martial gentlemen, to wit, Gandius, Ginandius, Sagandus, otherwise named Gagandus, Rutheragos, or Rutheranus, and Slonius. They sound like very Latinized versions of what would have been uh, probably more Irish sounding names. Uh, the last one is Slonia, King Slonia, not Sla Sla Slonius or Slanius. These five, perceiving that the country was not sufficiently peopled, were agreed, as it were, to cast lots and to share the whole realm between themselves. The four elder brethren ser severing the country into four parts and being loath to use their youngest brother like an outcast or stepson, condescended that each of them should, of their own portion, allot to Slanius a, porcel of their, a, a parcel of their inheritance, which being as heartily received of Slanius as it was beautifully granted by them, he settled himself therein, and of that portion it took the appellation of Media or Meath. The four parts meet at a certain stone in Meath, near the castle of Kildare, as an indifferent mirror to sever the four regions. Uh, and of course, uh, that is oh, he, he talks about it. Okay, and in another in in another place, the same authority describes this stone as umbilicus hiberniae, uh, quasi in medio in meditulio terri positus, and of course, umbilicus hiberniae is the. Uh, the belly button or the navel of Ireland, the Omphalos. This large rock is still to be seen on the hill of Ishnach near Kildare, county of Westmeath, and is now called Cat Ishni by the by the natives. And of course, that's the cat stone because apparently it looks like a crouched cat. And in the additions which Hooker has made to the first portion of the work of the English chaplain, we read. Meath in Latin media is one of the five portions of Ireland, according to the first division. It is the least portion, being but of 18 cantreds, but yet the best and most fertile, and lieth for the most part all within the English pale. And ever since the conquest of King Henry II, hath been subject and obedient to the English law's government. And because it lieth, as it were, in the navel, N-A-V-I-L-L, -L, and bowels of the land, it taketh the name accordingly, G-L-I-E, not G-L-Y, being called media, which is the middle. And he adds, there was no prince sole governor of this, as was of the other portions, because it was always allowed and allotted to the monarch, whom they called Maximum Regem or Regem Hibernia, as a surplus towards his diet, unquote. This latter, however, like many other statements of the same authorities, is to be received with caution. How are we getting on? Cathy May Deo is here. Hello, Cathy May. You're very welcome. We'll go on until about half nine, because I didn't actually start reading until half eight. So we'll go on for another 10 minutes, if that's okay, if you can manage to stay awake. Uh, we'll, 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 we'll do our best. Slonius, it is said, soon enlarged his dominions so that he obtained the monarchy of Ireland. This Slonius is entombed at a hill in Meath, which of him is named Slain. In subsequent times and up to the date of the English invasion, the five provinces were thus possessed. The O'Melachlins ruled in Meath, the O'Connors in Connacht, uh, the Mac MacMurrows, in Leinster, afterwards called the Cavanaghs, and the O'Briens in Thomond or Munster. To this day, Meath is the great grazing ground of Ireland. 
In it are to be found the most extensive sheep walks and pasture lands, the finest horned cattle, with the exception of those in Roscommon, are bred in Meath, and its vicinity to the metropolis, as in Dublin, and the sea has always afforded it a ready home consumption and an easy mode of transit to the English markets. Its crops are generally so luxuriant and its land so fertile that it has been asserted that if it were all grown in corn, it would feed and might, sorry, it would feed and might form the granary for the whole of Ireland. Its natural capabilities and particularly its flat level surface must have rendered it easy to retain when once possessed by an invading army and easy to colonize by an industrious people. The fertility and riches of Meath more than once excited the cupidity of the roving Northmen, and several incursions of the Danes are enumerated in the annals, uh, but particularly that of Turgesius in the ninth century. Naturalists have been at some pains to discover from whence or through what breeds the present improved English race of short-horned and other highly esteemed varieties of domestic, of domestic oxen have been obtained. And indeed, the question is not yet this decided. This fact, however, is certain, that in the bogs and marshes of Meath at Dunshocklin, not far from the River Boyne, numerous remains of the ancient animals, both wild and domestic, which formerly existed in this country, have been discovered, and particularly those of oxen, which for beauty of head and horn might vie with the finest modern improved breeds of England. Notwithstanding all the pains and expense that have been gone to in bringing them to their present state of perfection, and yet there can be little doubt of those bones to which we have referred having lain beneath the surface for many centuries. The early population of Meath must have been very great, but owing to the clearance system which has long existed in this country, in this county, I apologise, and produced those extensive pasture lands to which we have alluded, it is now much less in proportion to its cultivatable land than that of any county, pardon me, in Ireland. And therefore, in several parts of it, the amount of labour is unequal to the demand. The peasantry are handsome, well-made, stout and healthy, but more serious and taciturn than those in the mountain districts of our island. And as might be expected, the admixture of races is here so great that the ethnologist is puzzled to make out Celts from Saxons or distinguish Milesians from those retaining any vestige of the primitive tribes, as may be done in other parts of the island. The colour of their frieze, F-R-I-E-Z-E, is a light grey, contradistinguished from the blue of the west and the dark brown of the south. The costume of the females has of late become less national than in other parts of the kingdom. And as civilization extends, the English broadcloth is worn by great numbers. See how he equates the growth of the British Empire with civilization. Uh, that is definitely colonial language, isn't it? Some 20 or 30 years ago, before the large flax mills and factories were established on the Boyne, the female attire was more picturesque and less diversified. In the flourishing days of the linen trade, when the fields waved with the beautiful bells of the flax and pipers played at the camps and the pickums in all the villages, most of the females, young and old, were then employed in spinning and dressed in black felt hats, like the Welsh of the present day, green linsey woolsey gowns and red flannel petticoats. When their occupation ceased on the establishment of the flax mills and the decline of the linen trade, this dress was abandoned, perhaps from the means of procuring it being withdrawn. But also owing in a great measure to the breaking up of the clanship which then existed among the spinners, who used to meet in numbers at the farmers' houses and work and dance and sing almost without intermission for several days together. That's... Sounds like a real Irish hooli. Native music and poetry are not found to flourish on great plains such as Meath as luxuriantly as they do in the hills and dells of more elevated regions. Yet the lasses of the Boyne are by no means as sombre and phlegmatic as the men. And songs, tales, fairy legends, country dances and planksties 
with wandering bards and shanachies and their tales and of pishogs, thievishes and superstitions, together with blind pipers and lame fiddlers, are not wanting to enliven the dull, tedious evenings of winter, from Kells to Maiden Tower. And of course, the Maiden Tower is the tower at Mornington at the mouth of the Boyne. Passing over the occupation of Meath by a line of heroes that certainly were not when the foregoing topographical descriptions were given, a royal ragged race of Tara, and the early monarchs and chieftains from Con of the Hundred Battles, the venerable Cormac MacArt, Nile of the Nine Hostages, and Finn McCall, uh, the Fingal of Macpherson's Ossian, whose history as exhibiting the state of civilization in Ireland, as well as the habits, manners, and customs of the people in their times, is well worth the attentive study of our readers. We arrive at the days of the Melachlins, who were kings in Meath at the time of the English invasion, when a daughter of that royal line, uh, Dervergal, the faithless bride of Brefni, and the Helen of the Irish Iliad, was seduced by the ill-fated Dermot MacMorrow, king of Leinster. O oh, degenerate daughter of Erin, how befallen is thy name! And through ages of bondage and slaughter, thy country shall weep for thy name. The English monarch deposed the rightful O'Melaclin and made a grant of the fair province of Meath to Hugh de Lacey, one of the fiercest of the soldiers of Strongbow, with, according to some authorities, the title of Lord Palatine. The Boyne's Bank became, in after years, the boundary of the English Pale, and numerous castles and strongholds rose along it, occupied by the Anglo-Norman families already enumerated. In the region of Henry VIII, Meath was divided into East and West. Notwithstanding our promise not to enter too minutely into the subject of Irish history, or break the text by constant references to authorities, we cannot prevent ourselves, though at the risk of detracting from the interest of the romance, relating a few truths, at least a few well-authenticated historical facts, connected with some of the dramatis personae of the English invasion. The day has gone by when the fable and fact of history could be presented to the reader indiscriminately, and Irish men in particular, so often accused of expressing themselves in superlatives, jumping at conclusions and drawing so largely upon their imaginations, should endeavour, while they popularise popularize their history, to present nothing, even in a guidebook, but what is strictly founded on good authority. The elopement of Jarvergill uh, with Dermot McMurrow is generally believed to have been the sole cause of the English invasion, but this is questionable. At least the subject requires to be further investigated, although there could be little doubt, but it rendered the King of Leinster more obnoxious to O'Rourke and his connections, the O'Connors of Connacht, than he had previously been and probably hastened the catastrophe. And I think I'm going to leave it there for now. Uh, that is the wonderful, uh, the beauties of the Boyne and Blackwater. Uh, although the, the reprinted version only has the Boyne and Blackwater, uh, the original was called Beauties of the Boyne and Blackwater by Sir William Wilde. I should mention that uh, one very, very recent arrival to the library in the past week or so is called The House, The Fall of the House of Wilde. And this promises to be very interesting. Uh, so I'll, I'll just read. This This maybe puts a little bit of context to what we've just been reading from. Uh, it does not detract at all from the fact that Sir William Wilde was obviously a, 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 a brilliant writer, uh, a wonderful composer of prose, uh, and probably a great scientist and all the rest. Oscar Wilde's father, scientist, surgeon, archaeologist, writer, was one of the most eminent men of his generation. His mother, poet, journalist, translator, hosted an influential salon at 1 Merrion Square. That's in Dublin, by the way. Together, they were one of Victorian Ireland's most dazzling and enlightened couples. When, in 1864, Sir William Wilde was accused of sexually assaulting a female patient, it sent shockwaves through Dublin society. After his death some 10 years later, Jane attempted to re-establish the family in London, where Oscar burst 
irrepressibly upon the scene, only to fall in a trial as public as his father's. So there you go. His uh, his uh, his memory is not completely uh, unsullied, shall we say? Um. Rowan Grove is the one who made this comment. Poetic license equals good. Presenting something entirely made up as a genuine ancient lore equals not so good. As a storyteller, I know the difference. Yes, absolutely. Um, yeah, uh, in indeed. Uh, that is uh, the uh, as far as I'm going to read this evening. I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, Wilde's book is still an indispensable guide, um, uh, regardless of the the uh, scandals of his own lifetime um and it is still widely referenced by modern day archaeologists and historians uh, as being the first sort of comprehensive exploration of the boyne valley uh, not just in terms of the history but also the mythology and and even incorporating that sweep of of of, of views of the people and the the productivity of the landscape and the agriculture and uh, the culture of the people who lived on its banks so that's it for now don't forget that if you want to support mythical ireland as always the uh, patron address is there just there patreon.com forward slash mythical ireland please consider becoming a patron those of you who are patrons will be getting the august update video very shortly lots and lots and lots happening here in the background not so much happening on social media as a result uh, but a huge amount of work being done here in the background uh, and lots of projects uh, on the go, either uh, in the planning stages or the uh, aspirational stages, or in fact, uh, in, in, in the working uh, towards getting them done stages. Uh, so there you are. Uh, don't forget that uh, if you're interested in uh, a 2022 Mythical Ireland calendar, pre-orders are now open on the website at mythicalireland.com. And also, don't forget that uh, all of my published books are available through the website uh, and signed copies will be dispatched around the world to anybody who wants to buy one. Uh, thanks all, everybody, for uh, joining us this evening. Sorry I was a day late, but I hope you understand. And uh, I think we had a, a nice uh, gathering anyway. Stay safe and stay healthy and stay well until next week. Hope the weather is good wherever you are in the world. Hope that today, if it's Tuesday for you, those viewers in Australia, uh, that uh, you, you, on the other side of the world that you have a good uh, Wednesday. For the rest of you, to the west of us here over the Atlantic, I hope that the rest of your Tuesday. That was coming. I need to go to bed. Too much celebrating yesterday. A real pleasure, Michael Darby says. I thought you were going to say a royal pleasure. You get it? Royal County. Never mind. Anyway, please feel free to share your jokes. Not here. I mean, you know, send me on a few jokes, and uh, maybe, maybe that's one for a, a topic for for one of the nights, um, for one of the live streams. Uh, Cahal wants to know if it would be possible to do a video that explains where we can find photos of the various original manuscripts and what makes one translation better than another. Oh, um, hmm. photos of the various original manuscripts. Yeah. I, I mean, some of them are available online, but some of them aren't. Uh, the translations, it, it, quite a lot of it's kind of take it as take it or leave it, because in some cases there's only one translation, or you know, there uh, as we had discussed on several episodes of Live Irish Myths, some of the translations are in sort of antiquated or archaic English, and so they probably need to be retranslated for you know in a more contemporary version of the language. Um, yeah, that's something we could certainly consider. In the meantime, all that remains for me to say to everybody is Ikawa, good night, Kolosov, sound sleep. That's only if you're going to sleep. Don't go to sleep if it's the middle of the day, unless, of course, you want your midday, your middle of the day nap. Uh, Kolosov, Kolosov, Ikawa Kolosov, Slongafol, bye for now, and the most important one of all, which is, as you know, say it with me. I'm listening for all of you. Adel Perth says goodbye. Yes, indeed. Togue Gobogay. Take it easy.